morning, everyone. I think... Uh, hmm. I thought I would confess from the very beginning <clears throat> my line of thought by uh, entitling this little discourse, A University for the Future, A Humanist Reimagines. So I confess from the very beginning my bias. My core prescription for a university of the future is quite subjective. So I must begin by providing its genesis. This background is especially required, I think, for those whose experiences are remote from what ours have been in Nigeria through more decades of decay and turmoil than I care to remember. I envy all those who have been exempted from that kind of experience. Now, the deterioration of one's university perceptions under successive regimes of both civilian and the military orders, frankly, drove one to despair. Even the basic campus social life had broken down, a condition that I tried to summarize in a public lecture that went under the title Descent of Barbarism and End of the Collegial. Educational standards have plummeted so low that the word illiteracy became more applicable within than outside the ivory towers, leading UNESCO to classify Nigeria at that time, I quote, as one of the nine countries in the world which together account for 70% of the globe's illiterate population. This is just between 15 and 20 years ago. We do not need to be reminded that primary and secondary education form the base material for the intellectual quality of tertiary institutions. Now, compound the kind of deterioration I've described in the primary and uh, secondary school system with the fact that the tertiaries themselves indulge in a season where any excuse whatsoever was used to foment strikes from the three university estates, faculty, student, and workers. And then, with that combination, you obtain a simple recipe where a course that normally would last for three or four years extended to five or six. And so on, constantly downhill. This collapse of intellectual and social life, so palpable as to be measurable, was not, however, the most pressing concern that one felt at the time, though, of course, it generated anxiety. A far grimmer threat loomed over the university. <clears throat> it was the assault on what I term the ecumenism that should prevail in such institutions one whose early portents did not at first appear life-threatening, albeit frightening for the observant and the concerned. And yet, while the laboratories became obsolete for lack of equipment and the libraries shrank from lack of replenishment, the mosques and churches within and immediately outside the campus grounds multiplied and flourished. The only books that seemed never to be in short supply were the Quran and the Bible. The born-again phenomenon saturated campuses. Hallelujahs competed with Allah Akbar in raucousness across student halls and converted lecture theaters in and out of even days of worship, eroding the peace and quiet required for concentrated study and reflection. Even faculty members raised churches. They added pastor, right reverend, prophet, archbishop, overseer, eminent, supreme mullah, etc., etc., to the academic titles. Recruitment of new faithful was at fever pitch, and peer press pressure was relentless in overcrowded dormitories. Sermonizing tapes were often glued to the ears of these captive students during hours of sleep, so that the last sounds that they heard before collapsing from exhaustion and the first on waking were the hypnotic voices of their clerics, scrambling their already overburdened brains still further and turning them into scriptural zombies. We recorded cases where some of the brightest students were permanently turned off their purpose in these institutions 
having been brainwashed into that line of self-abnegation that made them believe that academic brilliance was a sin of pride, a failing that could only be expiated by giving themselves up completely to one or the other supreme deity at the expense of their studies. The children of notable figures were especially targeted, the purpose being to bring their parents under the control of religious ministries. I do not exaggerate. Something had to give, and it was not long before religious rivalry took a physical turn, threatening to set institutions on fire. Crusade countered jihad. The signs were ominous. They would inevitably evolve into an agenda of anti-scholasticism that, if uh, it is any consolation, threatens the very notion of objective instruction right across the globe today. And this it was that informed the tone of my lecture um, two decades ago, as I took my listeners along an imagine, imaginary stroll through the campus of my alma mater, as it was in my student days, lingering at the major points of disquiet and making comparisons. Here is the pertinent excerpt from that guided tour. I quote, if I were given a lecture of this title within the university where I was a student for two post-secondary school years, I would insist on making it a walking seminar. We would arrive eventually at the designated zone of worship on campus where the first religious structure was erected, the Protestant chapel, to be joined later by the Roman Catholic, then the Muslim mosque. We would pause there perhaps for a few moments of reflection and I would then remind you of a period of religious irrationality about 20 years ago when political agents provocateurs invaded campus with their bags of money and chronic intolerance, attempted and succeeded for a while in whipping up a potentially violent confrontation between different sects of believers, came close to unleashing a religious war by giving ultimatums for the removal of a cross on the grounds that such a symbol polluted the purity of their worship since it stood in their line of vision when they looked east. I would recount the role of the Minister of Education who summoned the Vice Chancellor and ordered him to remove the offending symbol. The principled response of that Vice Chancellor was as follows. Sir, it would be far easier to remove me as Vice Chancellor than to uproot that cross from where it stands. Now, the symbols of both Christian and Islamic religions have remained in place ever since, a testimony to the triumph of collegial integrity and a repudiation of mindless fanaticism and bigotry at the highest level of administration. And I would end that session by saying this, the very cohabitation of those two contending symbols, like the cohabitation of opposing ideas and philosophies, is the very essence of the university idea." End of quote. Those who seek to understand the origins of the longest sustained and most vicious anti-intellectual, anti-creativity movement unleashed on the world of learning in recent times must learn that at the very least, the enemy has long penetrated within. And that names like Daesh, Boko Haram, Joseph Kony, or Lord's Resistance Army, etc., etc., have their roots and propulsive energy from within the supposed citadels of objective learning, either as instigators or collaborators. We breed them, either through complacency or through resignation. One of Alice Laquena's closest lieutenants was a university professor. I once listened to him espouse that cause on BBC in religious terms. The leader of one of the disruptive religious forces in Nigeria today, supposedly a Shiite, graduated from a northern Nigerian university. If on entering the ancient city of Timbuktu, perhaps one of the earliest learning institutions on the black African continent after Fez in Morocco, Ansar Dean 
headed obsessively for the ancient libraries of Mali on a triumphal march whose climax was planned to be the torching of their contents, let us always remember that others, supposedly educated, have softened and are still softening the ground ahead of his perverse mission. It is only thanks to the heroic commitment of a few dedicated servants of the Muse of Learning, of cloak and dagger operations involving deception, diversion, sometimes at the risk of their lives, that hundreds of thousands of these ancient library collections were saved. Without those unsung heroes, the intellectual heritage of Mali and of the African continent would be today mere ashes of the past and a chorus of impotent lamentations. And let no one believe that the menace is over or that the enemies of the university idea are war weary. How can that be? So now to my proposition, one that evolved from this desperate search for a fundamental reformulation of a collective university psyche. Certainly no one will deny that in those bygone days, however troubled in other ways, the, universi the universities never came across any agenda of human decimation remotely close to what was recently experienced in Nairobi, nor experienced any of the early religious massacres in the universities in northern Nigeria. I refer to the harrowing scenario where the religious night raiders reading from a list that was undoubtedly provided by some of the college students themselves, called out the victims one by one, knifed, bludgeoned, and shot them to death. Those victims were the supposed unbelievers. I refer to the now obscured fortist of religious ecstasy of the morbid kind that has now become rampant on our continent and against whose background one's mind finds itself roaming far and wide for frantic, even temporary, solutions. My prescription is not complicated. It proposes a year of materialist induction to detoxify incoming minds from inherited or acquired religious zealotry. Note, I do not say religion. Simply, it's dehumanizing extremism and accompanying intolerance that are so easily turned towards a divine core for the elimination of non-adherence. There are numerous ways of uh, achieving this, I suppose. Uh, there's always surgery, some kind of lobotomy, a surgical operation to excise the gene of intolerance wherever located in the brain. No, I think we can opt simply for something more practical. A year of induction, a pre-enrollment obligation where the student is sticking through a course of material explication for the seeming mysteries of phenomena, including the human. Our destination is not so much the preventive measures that the academic community must adopt for its own survival, as it is a template for the mental rehabilitation of a vulnerable and targeted species, the young student. While universities of the air have laudably enabled access, not only to instruction, but to the democratization of its formal acquisition and structures of adju adjudication, leading to graduation, I regret that their retrogressive counterparts, the theocratic, have been no less assiduous in their own conversion of that open facility, especially through internet. They can claim, simply from their sanguinary graduation tests alone, the, fattest, the fastest and most effective recruitment into the unidisciplinary academy that I occasionally refer to as the Academy of Morbid Resolution. Our target should be, therefore, the mind, how to retune it and render the mode of indoctrination of its perverse mentors ineffectual. It is within the domain of student enrollment and foundational curriculum that the battle mostly resides. Target the mind. Resource, material environment, and the watchword, ecumenism. Catch them young should be more than just a slogan. 
It should become a declaration of purpose and should admit of no apologies for its materialist orientation. It is no more than an experimental model based, however, on our experience under the colonial structure, the various stabs at decolonization of learning, the current bloodstained rampage of theocratic Philistinism, and even borrowings from the ancient beginnings of the university movement. The sheer horror of narratives, of living witnesses, such as Karima Benunes, your fatwa does not apply here, or Nafi Sultan's, the God who hates, among others, have contributed to what might seem an extreme approach to an underground threat, where the greatest instigation has been the once unthinkable ordeal of my own nation, Nigeria, in the form of an affliction called Boko Haram which effectively crippled intellectual life across huge swathes of northeastern Nigeria. Now, how do we orientate, reorientate the minds to practicalities? On entering the university, incoming students will be made to leave their books behind. They would, however, be free to use the library, but be restricted to the reference section, carefully selected, for its multidisciplinary scope. Admittedly, it is difficult to conceive how electronic access, Wikipedia, etc., Google, will be managed since ideally they should all have access only to the same works of reference. But I believe that it is not beyond a solution. Each student, and they should be from all compass points, no matter their ultimate disciplines, each student first engages the immediate environment as autonomous entity, indeed as a sole material from which abstract ideas and concepts, hopefully transformative, can emerge. We're speaking here of approaching and tre treating physical environment in its own existential self-sufficiency. It should be only after that first initiation year that they are permitted to relate them to externalized origins, such as being proposed as creations of a divine supermind. They may choose to call upon them as examples of divine manifestations, but only after that first year. That first year, before they move on to other disciplines, be these physics, chemistry, literature, aesthetics, or even religious studies. We're speaking here of an uncompromising materialist foundation to the encounter, their encounter with phenomena. Glass or stone buildings, thatch roofs or ceramic tiles, manicured lawns or, or rough and ready scrubland, the college farms or shops, the residential quarters or playing fields, no matter the choice, as long as the choice is within a common environment or treated holistically. I'm speaking here of a proceeding of closed monkish existence, a period of mental stimulation where each student is schooled in the powers of observation, discovery, and comparison in their own right, including the histories of the very material entities that have shaped their micro environment. They would be introduced into the history of what their predecessors have made of such material surrounding how such surrounding has been neglected, altered, enhanced, degraded, etc., etc., by the human hand and mind, and hopefully how such environments in turn have shaped their predecessors. They would make comparative studies of how the minds of their colleagues respond to the same environmental peculiarities and exchange notions about the varied entities they encounter during their campus strolls. Shall we say a rock tumulus, a stream, an artificial lake, a frog, a butterfly, a tree through its seasonal changes, a lizard, molten snakes, whatever crosses their paths. If their studies lead to any deity, fine. But they can only express such findings during the examination at the end of the first year. While obviously their deductions will be influenced by early home upbringing, guaranteed to include religious indoctrination, they would at least be compelled to apply their own individual intelligence to questioning, reinforcing, 
adjusting or repudiating received lessons. Such exchanges would take place in the familiar seminar format where they will engage others on a platform of equality of probabilities. Received knowledge would score below deductive arguments, while claims of revelation in any form would earn the pupil instant expulsion. This exercise in intense mental discipline based on the interaction of the mind on a limitless yet delimited, <clears throat> delimited zone of occupancy in near monkish seclusion would form the character of the student crop and that and thus the intellectual signature of the institution, at least my institution. That's it in a nutshell. Now, to some references and arguments for this structured extremist proposition. First, there's a question that comes up again and again since the beginnings of formal learning and structural experimentation. That obvious question being, to what purpose the university? It is the answers that are not so dogmatic since they tend to shift and adjust with time. If we began with the religious order, which was the original home of early universities, the answer could be summed up as in order to serve God better, to assist mankind, assist mankind in deserving God. Indeed, this was the first basis impulse, basic impulse that led to the creation or evolution of some of the oldest rudimentary learning institutions of the world. Within the more open, more accommodating terrain of theological order, however, a more modest response might restrict itself to raising the human entity to a higher and higher realm of self-realization until it ultimately deserves, uh, deserves God. And yet others, grounded entirely within the human realm of secular ideology, would repudiate any extraterrestrial notion of an end in view, contend itself with an agenda that reads purely for the transformation of humanity through the acquisition of an interrogation of knowledge. The elitist consciousness evolved much later. The notion that the progress of society is predicated on the selective nurturing of a few gifted minds on whom the direction and management of society would depend. Finally, the liberal idea, which can be summed up as education for education's sake, especially in the humanities. This is perhaps a refinement of the last mentioned school of propulsive elitism. Some of these universities, let us remember, were virtual monasteries. And I include here the pre-European institutions of learning, such as those of the Arab world. Scholars were indeed a monkish, near Kabbalistic lot, many of whom, however, also traveled from institution to institution, accumulating and translating manuscripts, exploring the world of figures and quantities, pursuing and evolving first principles from the movement of the stars and attempting to answer the basic philosophical question, the why of existence. This was a pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, even where downgraded. Knowledge, let us all admit the obvious, is an inexhaustible affair. It holds many of us in thrall and will probably continue to do so long after we are able to consummate its intellectual lust. And so it is time that we began to think of reverting to that principle of intellectual inquiry for its own sake. Only this time, privileging the materialist tendency against the outward directed. Objectively, and in a spirit of inquiry, this secular bias deserves its own time and orientation. And in a mode of concentration that compensates for centuries of theocratic privilege however thinly disguised. To put it harshly, the theocratic has exacted such a heavy toll on the intellectual pursuit, both in ancient and recent times, that drastic strategies are mandated for weaning the young mind away 
from the revelationary overlay on material manifestations, even of the unacknowledged subliminal level. It is not only theocratic, however, but simply revelationary, dogma for power's sake, a system that thrives principally on imposition rather than discovery, one that leaves no room for testing or questioning, even at its most rudimentary. Secular ideology has proved no less tyrannical on the mind, as was the case of the Soviet Union and its uh, satellites under that other form of fundamentalism, the Stalinist Lenin Leninist legacy, which created a very special breed of learning generation, one whose personality was perhaps best captured in the product of the Komsomol. That model of youth mobilization found facile emulation in various degrees by would-be revolutionary regimes in our third world, some of whom sought to outdo even the Soviet model in rigidity of thought. Within such institutions, even history underwent the most egregious forms of revisionism to the extent that whatever did not fit into the tidy schema of socioeconomic development or the prevailing theory of social formation was simply deemed not to have taken place. Of course, this could not endure, and I mean by that that the cracks within such hermetic enforcement had begun to crumble, uh, had begun to appear long before the crumbling of the Berlin Wall. Reformation to be enduring always begins from within, but with spread, uh, widespread ramifications for its society beyond the campus perimeter. Take the United States, for instance, where centuries of exclusion and or denigration of socio-historical knowledge that related to a large section of the world, the African, was dramatically reversed. It was as a result of the agitation, sometimes violent, of the African-American population of the United States that libraries and classrooms were progressively purged of racist literature, while an infusion of the authentic material, historic and cultural, of the African continent became a requirement of higher institutions. Departments or institutes of African studies sprang up in numerous colleges. The movement led to a reassessment of the canonical approach to literary and cultural material that favored near exclusively the European world, Eurocentricity. Eurocentricity. Disciplines that stretch from black history and politics to African traditional architecture, Egyptology, black aesthetics, agriculture, were now gingerly, then compulsorily embraced. This was a development that reached out beyond ivory towers themselves to affect the outer society, led to the progressive transformation of what, even into the 70s, was still a deeply racist society and a divided populace. But as the saying goes, all that was then. Today, the critical issues are even less abstract. The survival of the university idea has moved beyond ideas or neutral postures, knowing that the universities themselves are no longer the sanctuaries of learning that we like to think they are, but find themselves often at the front line of sudden and bloody violence. Again, nothing historically unusual. I recall uh, on a visit to the University of Barcelona, I was shown heavy tomes that still bore the bullet holes of the Spanish Civil War. Ancient, irreplaceable volumes that were stacked against the windows to shore up, to shore up defensive ramparts, a function for which they were never created. Close to us at this spot in East Africa, Students were aroused from their beds in the middle of the night by the sounds of gunfire, nearly 50 of those eternally beyond arousal. Or further north, in Mao, Nigeria, enforced closure of universities by stormtroopers of religious irredentism, etc., etc., etc. Our universities of learning, once protected as sanctified spaces of innocence and learning, have opened up entirely new chapters in negative projections and thrown up a challenge that requires to be urgently answered by humanity in general. 
At the center of it all is the mind. That is the battlefield. And upon us, especially, who consider ourselves laborers in the field of reason and imagination, devolves the onerous duty of evolving strategies for nurturing the mind while others protect its housing. It is the mind that addresses the question, why is such and such possible? Historically, sociologically, philosophically, even psychologically, the mind must seek and find answers. And that task points to one summative destination, humanity itself. That living, breathing, conceptualizing organism that inhabits the human form. Can we really boast that it has been studied or is being studied holistically? If such a claim is made, then the study has proved so far a failure. It has failed to come up with an answer to that excruciating question of historic bafflement. How is it possible for this to happen? I'm not speaking now of humanism as a discipline, but of man itself, an undertaking in the ambitious vein of Alexander Pope's the proper study of mankind is man. Mind you, that uh, man of the European Enlightenment botched the job, since in the end all he did was justify the ways of God to man and ended up almost like a counter-university propagandist, albeit unwittingly, when he wrote, all nature is but art unknown to thee, all chance direction which thou canst not see, all discord, harmony, not understood, all partial evil, universal good, and spite of pride, in erring reason spite, one truth is clear, whatever is, is right. Nothing left for us to do, apparently, but to go about our normal business. But at least Pope recognized throughout his epistle a need to seriously tackle that subject. And here on the African continent today, we find ourselves to ponder deeply his representational interrog interrogatory in the line, why then a Borgia or a Catiline? Which today, on our part, would probably read, why then an Al-Shabaab or a Boko Haram? Why do some of the same faith so passionately loathe learning, even when their prophet preached respect and protection for the people of the book? That is the question. If the university were able at least to insert that question into a field of study as a permanent requirement, it would have contributed in no small measure to a distinct sector of intellectual pursuit as a model that can be followed in other zones of intractable conflict. And one sustainable approach to the study, man, is to observe and analyze how his or her mind responds to actual phenomena. In short, the workings of the mind. We are thrust back, it seems, to the claims of purposeful, purposeful or shall we say, utilitarian approach to the university idea, but on a universal dimension. To summarize, and here let me dilute my own commencing prescription, the framework is secondary. A year's initiation through a monkish sequestration or an accompanying parallel exercise side by side with other disciplines during the three, four, or seven years of indentureship at the shrine of knowledge, the real destination is a model whose incoming minds are made, where incoming minds are made to undergo a contemporary version of the age-grade ritual, one in which that mind is compelled to recompose the world in his or her own image. An individual template against which both tested and untested, that is, dictated knowledge, are bounced. A university reimagined should resolutely turn its back on its own clerical beginnings, liberate its putative occupants from the last clerical shackles that still stand in the way of universal enlightenment. Is this a task for one branch of the learning institution alone, the humanities, for instance, the physical sciences, or the social sciences? Or does our predicament require a holistic approach? Obviously, a holistic, 
since this, only this comes close to the vastness of the mind, a foraging ground for all facts, digestive system for propositions from observation and knowledge, the crucible from which emerge notions that may alleviate the need of humanity for every conceivable pursuit. In taking that approach, I believe we may be close to one unassailable, unassailable agenda for university of the future, one that should commence today, even as bombs are being dropped on the last stubborn redoubt of the forces of morbid atavism. We're speaking, in short, of a fact-based, not abstract, but reality-informed project of self-enlightenment, and one that enables us to remain on terra firma, not seek solutions in the hereafter. Where do we begin? We could do worse than let science, operating with our close sibling facilitator imagination, instruct us. Science is discovery, revelation, stagnation. If the university is not to stagnate, it must embark on a permanent voyage of discovery. Thank you very much.